So for our last video, we took a look at the Run Python um, and Python console and uh, experimented a little bit with basic objects in Python like numbers and strings. For this video, we're going to look at a process for actually writing programs in Python. And we're going to use runpython.org for that. So go to your browser and uh, type in runpython.org into the URL and you should come to this page. Now, the reason for creating runpython.org is that it gives you a way to create and execute Python code on the web. Python normally is a program that you run natively on your Windows or Mac or Linux computer. And there have been limited options for doing this on the web until recently. There are some other websites that are really good for this. Um, uh, REPL.IT. Um, is another great site that lets you run Python in the browser. And also the Brython, Brython uh, website itself um, has a code editor and environment for creating code and executing code. The, the trick behind runpython.org is that it links this Brython in the browser Python programming to GitHub. And GitHub is an independent website that's very, very good at storing and archiving computer code. So runpython.org works with GitHub as the back end for storing your code. And that way, runpython.org doesn't actually store anything. It's just an interface for running Python code. So to start out with, um, if you've seen the console, this looks a little bit different. We have um, an editor area on the left and then an output area on the right. And by default, when you go to runpython.org, it fills in the editor with uh, a Python print statement or print function. We're going to remove that and just type in a number. And we did this before in the console. We'd type a number and press enter, and we'd get the number back. So if I type a number here in the editor and press the enter key, meh, it just leaves it there. So this is basically like a word processor, a Google Docs. Um, I'm creating a series of instructions, a series of statements in Python. And this is just an editor that lets me rearrange and, and compose these statements in Python without actually executing anything at all. If I want to run my Python program, I have to click the Go button at the top. Whoops, whoa, full screen is really getting moved on here. Okay, Go. I executed my Python program. May you'll notice that nothing appeared to have happened, and nothing appeared on my right hand output screen. So this is a big difference between running a Python program and playing around in the console. When you type a number in the console, Python spits it back to you. If your Python program just has a bare number in it and you execute it, Python looks at that and says, hey, I got the number 10. It creates an object that represents the number 10. And then it's just content with that. <laughs> and the program exits and nothing else happens. So a program that just has a number in it, it's not very interesting. One thing you can do is use that print function that you might have seen earlier. So uh, print is a name of a reserved function in Python um, that lets you output things to the console. So if I take that number 10 and enclose it in parentheses and put the word print in front of it, I'm doing a whole bunch of things at once here. So print is the name of a function in Python. And when you want to execute a function in Python, you type the name of the function and then parentheses um, left and right. Now, you can have parentheses with nothing in them at all. And that executes the function and doesn't give the function anything to do. So some functions work just fine without anything uh, in the parentheses. And other functions, like the print function, typically take something inside the parentheses. So let me try running this program. I'm going to click the Go button. Still nothing. Now let me try putting something inside the parentheses. I'll put the 10 back there, and we'll press the Go button again. And now, finally, I have some output in my output window. So in my program, the way to get something to appear as output is to print it using the print function. Uh, I can also print the strings that we played around with in the last video. So I can say print quote, my name is Eric, end quote. So inside the parentheses, I've created a string object by using double quotes. I 
can also use single quotes, but in this case I use double quotes. My name is Eric, uh, finished by double quotes. And that entire thing is again in parentheses and print comes before it. So I'm executing the print function by using the name of the function and a pair of parentheses. And inside the parentheses is an object that I'm giving to the function. So the function will take that object and do something with it. The role that the print function plays in Python is to emit or get, put out um, a, an output representation of an object. So in this case, it should just give me my name is Eric as the output. So let me click the Go button. And there in the right-hand pane, sure enough, I have my name is Eric. So my program is pretty simple. Let me go to the beginning of the program and hit the Enter key. I created a new line. And uh, let me make a variable like uh, my, I'm going to call it my name. My name equals Eric. Now I'm going to replace this object that I put inside the print function with the variable my name. So now I've got a two line program. Now, one thing I should mention about Python programs that uh, beginners often find confusing. I'm going to build up programs that have lots of lines in them. Um, and it's sort of like, well, where does this stuff all happen at once? Or is there some sort of order to it? And it's actually very simple. Python begins by looking at line number one in your program. And it looks at that line and attempts to interpret it as Python code and do whatever it's supposed to do. Once it's executed that line, it goes to the second line. If that's Python code, it executes it. If it finds a line that isn't valid Python code, it'll produce an error. So hopefully your programs never have errors. So here's my program. Assign the object Eric to the variable my name and then print my name. So what do you think it's going to do if I click the Go button? Eric. Now, just to point out how important ordering is, if I take the second line, delete it, and then paste it at the beginning of the program, is this program going to do the same thing or not? Print my name and then assign my name to be Eric. Hmm. I got a very confusing error. Trace back. Most recent call last. Uh, very confusing. So what you want to do when you get an error like this is uh, from the bottom, work your way from the bottom up and look for a line number. Um, the first line number you find says module, module, line one. And that refers to this first line of the program. Print my name. And here's the text of the error, print my name. So it's just regurgitating what was on that line. And then this is a description of the error, name error. It's not referring to my name. It's just saying that this uh, piece of text, my name, hasn't been defined to mean anything yet. So since Python executed the first line first, it tried to find some meaning for that variable called my name. And because it executes code from the top down, my name had not been defined yet. The fact that we ran this program earlier and defined my name to be Eric doesn't matter. Every time Python executes this program, it's basically starting from scratch. So your program has to be organized in a top-down fashion so that anything that it uses at any point in the program has been defined previously. So that means that often the very beginning of Python programs will define a bunch of variables. And then as the program works its way down the page, the variables are used to do various things. All right, so that's a very simple uh, example. Let me uh, undo that and uh, put that print statement back where it belongs. I should, before I go much further, point out that if you're writing a large program and you want to leave little notes to yourself uh, about what things mean,
you can create a comment. And in Python, comments begin with a hashtag character. And anything that follows that on that line will be ignored by Python. So I've created this comment. It says this is my introductory program. And then line two is really the first executable line of the program. And line three is the, the, the second one. So if I execute this, we're, we're in good shape again. I assign Eric to my name, and then I print my name. Now, we want our programs to be interactive with our users. So one thing you can do is accept text from the user. And the way you do that is with the input function. Uh, let me write a new line. So your name equals input. What is your name? So again, uh, this is a predefined Python function. The name of the function is input, and I'm executing the function by following it with the parentheses. Inside the parentheses is a string object that says, what is your name? I'm going to get rid of my name equals Eric. And I'm going to do something sort of interesting inside this print parentheses. I'm going to say, here's a string, hello, comma, end quote, and then the comma. Now this comma you'll notice is outside the string. So this is a way of separating the objects that are being passed into the print function. So I've got hello, quote, then comma, your name, comma, how are you today? So it's very interesting. Your name equals input. What is your name? print hello quote comma your name comma quote comma <laughs> it's a lot of commas there it's very confusing so you wonder if i run this program is it going to print all this junk on the screen well let's see go ah so i've got a little box that popped up it says what is your name um obviously i'm going to write my name eric okay and now my program is finished executing, and over in the output area, I see all of this stuff. So the first line in the output was the prompt that I saw in that little dialog, what is your name? My answer, which is Eric. So this is the result of executing that line on line two, your name equals input, what is your name? The second line was constructed from this print function, print, hello. So that was the first string object. And then Eric, which is the value that input assigned to the variable your name. And then how are you today, which was the third object passed into the print function. So first interactive program. Hello, what is your name, Eric? Hello, Eric. How are you today? So you can take lines like this and build up some pretty sophisticated programs. Now, right now, um, I can run this program as many times as I want, answer in different ways, and I'm having a great time. But if I leave this website and come back later, I'm going to find that my program no longer exists. So I want to be able to save my programs somewhere. So runpython.org has this great feature where it works with a service called GitHub. And I'm going to show you how to work with that. So let me take this out of uh, full screen mode. I'm going to open another tab. I'm going to type in a URL, github.com. Now, github.com is a website for storing source code for programmers. And it's free to create an account. Um, the issue with the free account is that any code that you store on GitHub is going to be public. So this is a great site for creating open source software where anybody can see it, anybody can use it. Um, so if this is the first time you've been to GitHub, you should go to the sign up link. And this is like creating an account on any social networking site, um, probably something you've done a million times. It's free. You, know, you pick a username, a password, give it your email address. Um, it's not going to do anything bad to you. It's, uh, it's a very benign website. Uh, very nice. So I already have an account, so I'm going to click the sign in link.
and I just mistyped my password. Nah, I'm not going to save that. And I've got this main um, dashboard for uh, github.com. So when you create your own GitHub account, your homepage on GitHub is probably not going to look quite like this. I've got a lot of stuff going on. So what I want to do to store my code is create a new repository. So when you go to GitHub, you should be able to find a button that says new repository. So you want to click that and um, pick a repository name. So I'm going to choose demo repo as my repository name. Pick whatever you want. There are probably some limitations on the characters and so forth, but should make it meaningful. And you can put in an optional description. This is a demo repository for my YouTube video. And uh, since I have a paid uh, GitHub account, I can create public and private uh, repositories. I believe the free GitHub account, you'll only be able to create public ones. And lastly, down here, this is something you really want to do. Um, you have an option to initialize this repository with a readme. Um, this is very, very useful. So um, click that. So initialize the repository of the readme. That will allow you to start adding files very easily. Um, if you want your software to be um, have some kind of a open source license, you can pick one here. Um, I, I'm fond of the MIT license. And you can also cre create a file called a gitignore. Um, uh, no problem if you don't do that now as you go on and, and do more work in, in Python and working with Git and GitHub, um, you'll eventually learn what the Git ignore is for and you'll start using it. So this is the basics. I've got a repo name, a description, indicated that it's public so anybody can find it and see it. And I've decided to initialize this repository with a readme. And optionally, I've created a license and the license will be added automatically to my repository. So then finally, I click the Create Repository button, and it's created my repo. So Tigger and Tady, that's the name of my account, and slash demo repo. So this is a place where I can store source code for my, my demo video. You'll notice in here, as I go down, I've got a list of files that are already created for me in my repository. I've got the license file. I can click on I can see I've got the text of this MIT license already added for me and I've got a readme file so it's created sort of a, a file that describes my repository and included my short description in it and a title demo repo so I can go in and edit this and create a more elaborate readme anytime I want so that's the basics now if I want to create a file that I can use and run python.org I can do it right here by clicking this button that says create new file. So I'll do that. Create new file. And it actually opens a new page with an editor, not too different from the one on runpython.org. Nothing in it. And I've got an important box up here that says name your file. So this is going to be the name of a Python source code file. And there's a few conventions you should follow. One is the name should be all lowercase. Python allows uppercase, but a good convention to follow is to keep it to lowercase and definitely avoid spaces in the name. So I'm going to use demo, all lowercase, one, dot py. The dot py are important because it tells every program that uses this file that it's a Python source file. So some programs, for example, GitHub itself, when you edit a Python file, it colors the text in the file um, to make it easier to understand what's going on in your program. And the way in which it colors that file is based on the fact that it knows it's a Python file. And that .py tells GitHub that you're dealing with a Python file. It's not essential that you do this, but it's extremely useful. So name, all lowercase, dot py, which stands for Python file. And I can put in uh, just a line of text. I'm going to create a short comment. This is my demo file. You remember, 
in run Python how the hashtag indicates that there is a comment. So I'm just creating a file that does absolutely nothing. And lastly, in order to make this thing stick, I have to go scroll down to the bottom of the screen to commit the file. So I'm creating um, demo1.py, and then I'm going to click the Commit New File button. Now this takes me back to the top page in my demo repo where I've got my license that I showed you before, my readme, and now I've got a third file, demo1.py. If I click on that, it shows me the contents of the file, which I just created. This is my demo file, and I can't edit this, although over here there's a button that lets me open the same editor I had before. In general, we're not going to use GitHub to edit our Python code. We're going to use GitHub to create a place to store it, and GitHub is going to keep track of any changes that happen to that file. Now, I'm in my demo1.py in GitHub. If I go up to the top where the URL is, double click on that to highlight the whole thing, and I'm going to press Control C to copy that. Now, I'm going to switch back to my Python server tab maximize the screen again. And up in the upper left-hand corner is a little text window where I can type in a URL. And this is supposed to be a GitHub URL. So if I paste with Control V the URL that I copied on the other tab, I now have the URL for my Demo1 Python program. Next, I'm going to load it. So now you can see in my left-hand pane on runpython.org, I've got my source file, the demo1.py, that I can work on. Now, this is all well and good. The program doesn't do anything yet. If I want to store my changes back to GitHub, I need to tell runpython about my account. And that's what this login button is for. So I'm going to go click the login button. And since I'm already logged in to GitHub and the other tab, it actually automatically associated. Um, if you are doing this for the first time, GitHub will ask you if it's okay to link to runpython.org. And you should say, yep, it's great. So now that I've got uh, myself logged in, I've got the log out button if I want to remove that association, and I've got a commit button. Um, I should Oops, it also removed the uh, URL that I pasted. So let me paste that URL back in and load my file. There's my demo file again. It's just that comment. And I can execute it. Nothing happens. Um, so let me go and type in a little piece of code here. Print. I'm going to execute the print function. Parenthesis. Quote. Hello. Python. Exclamation mark. I'm excited about it. There's my program. Hello, Python. So I'm going to execute that. Hey, it works great. I think this is an awesome program. I think I want to save it. So to save this, I'm going to go up to the Commit button and click it. Now, what just happened? Nothing happened on my screen here. But if I go back to my GitHub page and reload the page I have here, I can now see that on GitHub, my demo1.py file has changed. I started out with, this is my demo file, but now it's been updated to match what I have on my Run Python page. Great. So if I go back to my Python server, I can continue to develop my Python program here. run it, test it, develop it, and anytime I've made a change that I think I might want to keep, I can click the commit button. And when I do that, the change gets automatically shipped over to github.com and saved. And this is pretty handy because at GitHub, you'll notice I can click this history button, and it actually keeps track of every single edit that's been made to this program. So that means I can go back in time and look at previous versions of the program I was working on and see the changes that I made.
It's useful if you make some changes that really ruin your program and you want to get back to an earlier state. You can, through GitHub, go back and restore earlier states of your program. Very handy. So, that's the basics of using Python server with GitHub.